Hello again. I hope you enjoyed the journey of Matcha Madness with me. It is certainly an exciting experience. I certainly learned a lot on multiple fronts. There's a whole just production side of everything that I had to learn. I did a, a course on shooting with the camera that I'm using. That was from DSLR Shooter here on YouTube. He did a series on shooting video with the camera that I'm using. He has a lot of good information on some audio as well as some additional lenses and lighting setups and stuff that I don't quite have the money to get into yet, but the course was just a good general introduction to the camera layout and everything like that, so that really helped. And I also did a Udemy course on editing videos with DaVinci Resolve, which all the videos that you've seen so far have been edited with. Not the most complex editing, Certainly, this is my first kind of foray into video, so hopefully as time progresses, I'll get a little bit better with that. And then, of course, there's the matcha itself. The whole point of Matcha Madness was to try and find my best matcha, right? Why do I keep kind of emphasizing my, 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 my? It's that taste is purely subjective, right? What I find to be the best matcha, in this case it was the Akatsuki from the tea crane, may not be the best matcha for you, but hopefully hearing the different notes that I was able to pick out could help other people decide what they want. Maybe you want something with a little bit more abrasive bitterness. When you heard me maybe discount a matcha because of that bitterness, you thought, well that's a great matcha for me. I, I want something with more bitterness. Maybe you don't like a really sweet and smooth matcha, so you, you wanted something a little bit different and hopefully some of those descriptors will help you as well. Just tasting so many different matchas, many of them back to back, was helpful just in general to kind of hone my sense of taste for what matcha can be. There are plenty of different flavor profiles that I was able to experience throughout the range of products. There's that very chocolatey note that I found in Blend 98, or there was that barley note that I picked up, right? Being able to taste so many different types of matcha can help you. You have to do the tasting to get better at the taste, right? Just like any endeavor in life, right? If you wanna get better at something, you have to practice it. Practicing taste is important. If you wanna get more out of what you taste, you have to practice tasting. And so this was also an experiment in taste. I want to do many more experiments in taste over different types of products, just tea in general. You know, we did we focused just on matcha for this series, but I'm going to be doing plenty more videos on tasting different teas. I also want to do whiskey, I want to do sake, I want to do wine potentially, coffee, all these different aspects to taste. And each field will give you a new kind of playground to look into. Well, you may find a barley note, right, in the that, in that one matcha, which I can't remember off the top of my head, but barley is a key component to whiskey, particularly scotch whiskey. Single malt, malt is barley, right? So that honing in on a barley flavor in your matcha can actually even transfer somewhat into tasting whiskey. Now that barley note might be slightly different, but when you get in your head, this is kind of what barley tastes like. It can transform your ability to appreciate other tastes in the future. Another thing that I learned through this matcha tasting journey, I mentioned at the end of the winning battle that kind of knee, right? So we have these four here from Breakaway Matcha. They're ultra, ultra premium. The uh, the Hakari and Riku and then the SE and Daphne are ultra good, but they just, and maybe it's still my somewhat limited exposure. Like I did a deep dive into matcha for a month here. I've only really been drinking matcha for a couple months at this point. What makes these for super premium offerings, super premium may still be slightly beyond my ability to discern at this point, right? And that's kind of that knee concept coming at us again, where the increase of quality for these is probably so minute that my ability to pick them up just isn't there yet. And so when something like the Akatsuke wins over something that's four times as expensive, that increase in quality is probably there, but you might be better off buying something like an Akatsuki or, you know, the Blend 93, which is their entry from Breakaway Matcha. It's still an extremely good matcha. When I tasted it again during this battle, I was kind of surprised at how good Blend 93 really is. It is a fantastic matcha. Is it better than Daphne? Absolutely not but it's still a really, really good matcha. My two favorite matchas going into the battle, before I started, I had tasted a few, and one of them was Blend 97. 
So that's why you see this. This is the 30 gram container of the Blend 97. I liked it so much. I actually went out and did buy a 30 gram container of Blend 97 after tasting the four gram sample. The Uji Hikari from Mayleaf, which opened my eyes to what premium matcha could be. I liked it so much. I bought six of these. So I have tons and tons of Uji Hikari from Mayleaf to work my way through. So even though Akatsuki was the ultimate winner. There's still other matchas that I'm going to be drinking regularly. And the matcha Akatsuki, while being my favorite, is still just one piece in my arsenal. If I was to only ever buy one matcha again, it would probably be the Akatsuki. But, you know, having some variety is still always nice. So there are two more things I want to mention in my kind of closing thoughts here. One is the organic offerings. There were a couple different organic offerings. These were the two, one from Arbor Teas and one from Upton Tea that are just so similar. I'm probably gonna have to do a side-by-side -side taste, but the containers and their names are so close. I wondered at the time when I did the Arbor if they were the exact same matcha, and they might be, they might not be, but regardless of whether or not they were the same, they just weren't particularly good. They were all right. The, the, the one from Arbor Tea was better, but I would not, I wouldn't even buy the one from Upton Tea again. I probably wouldn't buy the one from Arbor Tea again, but if I had it again, I wouldn't be disappointed. All of the organic offerings got kicked up very early in this series. What does that mean? Does that mean that organic matcha is inferior? Not necessarily, but in tea especially, organic isn't necessarily what you want to look for for quality. It can be an indicator, but price is usually a better indicator of quality than organic. If it's a high grade matcha or any high grade tea, it's going to be organic without getting that organic certification more than likely. Don over at Mayleaf did a whole video on or is organic better or not and he makes this very important point and I want to mention it here as well. Getting an organic certification costs money. If you want to be certified organic, you have to maintain all the practices that go into becoming organic certified, but you also have to pay a bunch of money to become organic certified. So the companies that can afford to be organic certified aren't necessarily producing the best. They might just have a lot of money and then they can slap on the label and make their potentially slightly inferior product sell better because now it has that organic label on it. Whereas a small farmer, you know, a lot of them, like, you know, Teiko-san, right? This comes from a super small, super limited supply, this farmer isn't going to be able to afford necessarily to buy that organic label, even though he's using all the same practices as an organic farmer and is producing a superior product, the organic label doesn't necessarily mean much in tea. In fact, you could even make an argument that when you see the organic label, it is slightly inferior even, because these are the people who maybe see their product is not being able to compete just on flavor. So if they put in the money to get that label added, then they can maybe sell more of them because people will be looking for their organic label and then flavor comes secondary. So it's just an interesting point, especially when you get into the high grade stuff, you're not gonna spend $200 for 30 grams of matcha and have it produced with a bunch of pesticides or something like that, right? When you get into the premium offerings, they're all gonna be produced exceptionally well with farmers that care and coddle their plants. That's enough of a tangent on organic. The last thing I wanna mention is that a couple of the matchas that you maybe saw in the beginning, notification of matcha madness and that you see on the table now, never even made it into matcha madness at the beginning that how I selected the teas for Matcha Madness is I bought a bunch of matcha. I sorted by price per gram. The 32 most expensive matchas made it into Matcha Madness. That means that there were several matchas that didn't make it into Matcha Madness. And while finding the ultimate matcha for me ended up being a quite expensive matcha, $50 per 40 grams, $1.25 per cup of matcha essentially if you do it the breakaway matcha style is expensive. There's no getting around it. And an expensive matcha is not something that everybody can afford. Forget daily drinkers. You may not even be able to splurge on your special moments matcha yet. So what I want to do is with the other matchas that didn't make it into Matcha Menace, I'm going to do a very, very short series called the best of the rest. So these will all be 
sub $1 per gram matchas. I have 12 matcha that didn't make it into Matcha Madness. All of them will be going into a mini tournament. I haven't quite decided yet the format of what best of the rest is going to look like. I'm not going to do the full tasting every day. The goal being to find a, a nice matcha that doesn't break the bank that can be your daily drinker. That series will be coming shortly. Again, I still need to work out the details on how I'm going to do it. I have one idea to just try and do just one video, do the whole thing in one video. I don't know how realistic that is. I will come up with something and then we can try and find the best matcha for sub $1 per gram and then hopefully give people a more price conscious option that hopefully will taste good. Of the 12 that will be going into the best of the rest battle. I've tasted two of them. One of them was all right, and one of them I'm not looking forward to tasting again. Let me just put it that way. There's usually a pretty steep curve coming up to that knee where you pay a little bit more and you get a little bit better quality, but at the beginning, you're, you're paying a little bit more and getting a lot better quality. On the lower end, it can actually be a pretty dramatic difference. So hopefully we can still find something down at those lower prices that will hopefully not only win the best of the rest, but actually will come with a recommendation to go out and buy it. Those are my closing thoughts. Thank you again for sticking with my Matcha Madness journey, and I look forward to seeing you in the best of the rest, as well as some other tea tasting and some other tastings. I also want to do some maker stuff. I, I've got 3D printers and a laser engraver, and I do a whole bunch of maker type stuff. That I want to feature but I thought Matcha Madness would be a good way to help get me into the YouTube world, get me used to recording video, getting used to editing videos. It gave me basically, you know, with the intro to Matcha, it gave me 33, 34 days worth of video for YouTube that I could practice my editing and practice filming and all of that. Hopefully the quality will just go up from here and uh, I'll see you for the next one. Bye.